Moving on to the diversity of life. So the diversity of the known life on planet Earth, that includes all the species that have been identified and named. So a lot of things have not been identified yet, but this includes at least 290,000 different species of plants, about 52,000 vertebrates. So that means animals with backbones and about a million uh, known species of insects which is about just over half of all known life forms insects are very successful animals uh, estimates of the total numbers number of species on the planet estimate from 10 million to more than a hundred million so it's a huge range and if you think of a hundred million that's just incredible and one of the reason why these numbers are so high is some of these species are small and microscopic, uh, not readily identifiable, or they're found in the deep ocean, places that uh, we haven't fully explored. Okay, so grouping organism species into um, convenient um, groupings. So the basic concept <clears throat> of this uh, biological living organisms are grouped according to certain similarities. So previously, in 100, 200 years ago, organisms were grouped together basically based on their appearance. Uh, it's gotten more specific now, or more detailed. So let's talk about what a species is. So a species, a group of organisms that live in a particular place or habitat. Habitat means their home, basically. And they have the potential to interbreed in nature and produce healthy offspring. And what we mean by healthy offspring is that the offspring, the babies, they can grow up and become adults and have offspring of them of their own. <clears throat> and it's important uh, to mention that this is in naturally occurring places, not like, say, in zoos. Um, so this identification or this uh, definition of a species is based on reproduction. So for example, um, you can breed a horse with a donkey and the offspring is going to be a mule. The offspring is a different species because it actually is infertile. It cannot have uh, offspring. Um, but what this tells biologists is that a horse and a donkey are actually pretty closely related but they are actually different species because they cannot produce fertile offspring. So the mule is a healthy animal. It has a relatively long lifespan, but it cannot interbreed. It is infertile. Uh, so again, a horse and a donkey are different species because they cannot produce healthy uh, offspring that are fertile. So biologists uh, sort Organisms group into broader and broader categories, <clears throat> excuse me, such as uh, rodents, which is a bigger group that includes things like squirrels, and insects, which includes many different things like uh, you know, ants, cockroaches, bees, butterflies, etc. So we're going to look at how scientists categorize and group living organisms. <clears throat> and that leads us into taxonomy. This is a branch of biology that deals with naming and classifying species. Naming them, giving them a species name, and classifying them based basically on their uh, evolutionary, evolutionary relationships. So taxonomists or taxonomy also arrange a species into a hierarchy of broader and broader groups. So for example, humans. Our species name is Homo sapiens. And the species name always has a capital first name, Homo, and a lowercase second name, species. So, for example, the domesticated horse is Equus ferus. Now, <clears throat> humans belong to the genus that's referred to as Homo, and the only living representatives of this genus are, human spe are humans, Homo sapiens. Humans also belong to a bigger family group that's referred to as a hominidae. And we also belong to a larger 
order group that includes or that is called the primates and includes all the other primates like humans and chimpanzees and um, gorillas and something called a bonobo okay <clears throat> if we look at the next bigger group it's called the class so the class now includes homo sapiens primates but also all the other mammals so that class is called mammalia notice that the groupings get bigger and bigger and bigger above that there's something called the phylum and that includes everything with the uh, spinal cord the chordata and then finally the kingdom is the animalia all things that are animals so notice that even though the horse is a different species than the human it also belongs in a different genera or genus different family different order ah but notice this is where we come together in the sense of uh, humans and horses fall into the same class we're, or both mammalia we're also both cordata and we're also both animals so <clears throat> this little chart ends at kingdom but there's a bigger grouping a broader grouping that's called the domain so there are three domains of living organisms that we have uh, classified today in terms of uh, scientific taxonomic categories and the three domains are bacteria like you know e coli that they belong and all the other type of uh, bacteria belong into what's called the domain bacteria they're all single-celled organisms relatively simple there's another group called domain archaea and they are similar to the bacteria <clears throat> but they are so different uh, genetically and their evolutionary background is pretty different that they actually fall into a different separate group the archaea domain archaea and then the domain you're probably more familiar with is called the domain eukarya and what that domain means is that the cells of these organisms have a nuclei they are eukaryotic organisms so that includes a smaller grouping so within the domain it includes the kingdom plantae the plants the kingdom fungi fungus the kingdom animalia the animals and then the what we're going to call the kingdom protist or protista which actually includes multiple kingdoms but for simplicity we're going to refer to it as uh, kingdom protista for now and that includes mostly single-celled organisms that are found in uh, water or aquatic environments aquatic means water okay. so bacteria and archaea have prokaryotic cells so the cells that they're made up of and again they're single-celled organisms are prokaryotic relatively simple cells basically they do not have nucleus to contain their dna contrasting that to the domain eukarya all organisms within the eukarya have eukaryotic cells so plants fungus fungi animals and protists all have nuclei or a nucleus singular within their cells that holds the genetic material the dna for example all right so the domain eukarya is broken up into groupings or divisions called the kingdoms Plantae, plants, as I mentioned, fungi, fungus, animalia, animals. And uh, most of these members of these three kingdoms are multicellular, meaning plants are made up of many, many cells. Also with the fungi, fungus, with one exception that we'll talk about later. And then all the animals are multicellular as well. One hint that they're multicellular is that they are big in the sense that you can see them with your naked eye you don't need a microscope to look at plants in terms of the entire plant or a fungus for the most part or any animal um, and the kingdoms are broken into their groupings or one of the main characteristic of these groupings kingdoms is how they obtain their nutrients food energy <clears throat> plants photosynthesize so they generate their own food which is actually pretty darn amazing. Fungi, they decompose things, so they digest normally dead organisms and absorb nutrients. So they are a type of consumer that's referred to as a decomposer. Right? They tend to break down dead things. And then animals, like humans, obtain their food and energy by consuming other organisms. Uh, the bun is made from plant material. The hamburger here is made from 
uh, beef, right? So we as animals have to consume our food in order to obtain uh, nutrients. So eukaryotes that don't fit into these three classifications, plantae, fungi, or animalia, are grouped into what we can call at this point the kingdom protista. Okay. Most protists are single-celled, as I mentioned, uh, like the microscopic amoeba, a little picture of one down here. But some protists are actually multicellular and pretty large, like seaweed. Seaweed is an aquatic protist, multicellular. It looks very much like a plant, but it actually is a protist, and it happens to be one of the largest protists around. So some major themes in biology that we will touch on throughout each chapter throughout the semester. There are five unifying themes. Evolution, living things evolve over time. Structure and function are linked together in the sense that certain things have a particular structure that allows them to have a particular function. This is a red blood cell. Its structure kind of looks like a donut with the donut hole in place, right? It's referred to as a biconcave disc. And that structure allows it to do its job, its function really well, is, and that is to uh, pick up oxygen and transport it through the body. Okay. Uh, what else? Uh, information flow. So this is a little diagram of uh, DNA deoxyribonucleic acid. This is the genetic material in living organisms. And the flow of information, as we'll find out as we get through the course, and in particular chapters, where's my cursor? Here we go. Uh, the genetic information is transferred into other cells through cell division, and is transferred to offspring. So your genetic information you inherited from your mother and father. So that's one example of the flow of information from the parental organism or cell to the offspring. Okay? Uh, energy transformations. Right? Animals have to consume energy to survive. Plants transform solar energy into chemical energy. So energy transformation is one of the main <clears throat> themes in biology. And finally, interconnections within systems. When we get to, say, uh, looking at an ecosystem, there's interconnections between all the organisms in a particular environment, for example. Okay, so five major themes uh, within biology. So let's look at evolution. Uh, what do a tree and a mushroom and a human have in common? At the basic cellular level, we're all made up of cells. Uh, we all have to assimilate energy. We can all reproduce. But also very importantly, we all have genetic material, DNA, that's uh, it's actually very similar in structure, basically almost the same in structure, and how that genetic material is copied and transferred to offspring, whether it's cellular offspring or just you know, like babies, is the same in all these different types of organisms. Right? So what can account for the combination of unity, meaning all living things have genetic material, all living things reproduce one way or another, all living things assimilate energy or utilize energy. Uh, so that's the unity of life. But the diversity, if you've ever been outdoors, there's a lot of different types of organisms out there. Okay? And we'll talk about these concepts as we get through, uh, especially the evolution chapters. So the scientific explanation uh, for the biological process or the biological processes that explain the similarity, uni unity of life, but also the diversity of life is evolution. And we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about the processes of evolution. Okay. Uh, so what is evolution? Uh, first of all, it's a, a fundamental principle of living organisms, of life on planet Earth. And it's the core theme that unifies all biology. Uh, so biologists take evolution as a fact. Uh, it's a factual concept, and we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about it. Uh, so the theory of evolution we'll get into in our next little section here, as we've run out on this one, run out of time.